Welcome guys to episode 8 of Tiger Heart Chats. I'm so happy we've got this far. When we started them, I didn't think there was going to be a lot of people listening to them, but we're getting lots of really positive responses, which is fantastic. If you are listening to this podcast, please do share this with your friend using Tiger Heart Chats, all one word, with the hashtag. Also subscribe to this channel. The word of mouth is the key to survival in the podcast world, so we really appreciate if you could tell people about what you're listening to. I'd like to welcome a fantastic guest to the show. He is the CEO of a company called The Little Wild Ones. With regards to my company, Tiger Heart, The Little Wild Ones actually are in charge of a lot of the motion direction of some of the projects we work on. And the CEO, his name is Kevin Francis. So please welcome to the stage, Kevin. Hi, how you doing, Sage? You all right? I'm all right, buddy. How are you doing? Very well, very, very well. Uh, Yep. All good, keeping busy um, keeping bus- and uh, looking forward to having a nice chat this afternoon. Awesome. There's going to be people that are listening to this podcast right now that don't know much about you. It'd be great if you could fill them in about you and the Little Wild Ones. Uh, yeah, well, I'm the founder of the Little Wild Ones. We're a animation and motion studio, um, primarily sort of doing uh, 2D, 2D and 3D work, but mostly 2D work, uh, sort of explain the film's content, um, short films. Um, we've been running for about uh, 18 months, a year, 18 months, um, with myself uh, primarily and my wife, Sam, who also helps out with sort of production as well. Let's talk about the animation world because you've been working in that space for how long now? Um, oh, about close to 15 years. Um, wow. I- how did you get into it? Uh, well, I did uh, animation at university at the Surrey Institute uh, in Farnham. Uh, did three years studying there uh, and then went into broadcasting uh, when I left. Started out as a runner in London and spent eight or nine years uh, in broadcasting, uh, working for a digital satellite broadcaster in West London where I headed up the design team there for five years um, before going freelance four five years ago now awesome and with regards to you being a runner yeah um, who did you run for uh, it was a company called ascent media um and they this was back in the days when uh, tape where everyone still used tape uh, so it was a lot of running around soho post houses sort of collecting delivering tapes uh, editing tapes um and the then i moved over into the design department where they were doing things like uh, Britain's Got Talent, the ITV shows as well. Were you like a creative director for a television house for a while? I ran the design department, the animation and broadcast graphics department for a a company. And we had about sort of 15 or 16 digital satellite channels, um, music, movie, kids channels. So we sort of managed most of the branding and uh, sort of branded content uh, for those channels. But it was only it was a small department. There was only five of us. Um, So it was, yeah, it was very busy, very hectic, uh, but a really good, great bunch of people. Um, and um, it was a great learning experience as well. It was, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good leading teams and sort of uh, bringing juniors through um, to sort of see what see what they had to offer, which was great. Amazing. And so now you you run the Little Wild Ones. You've been doing that for eighteen months now. A couple of projects that you and I have worked on together, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. Just going back to your animation background. Yeah. What drew you into animation when you, you know, when you first started first getting started into that? Out. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, my all of my background was always sort of design related coming through school. Um, and I originally, um, I sort of did art and design at college. And then I originally moved to uh, Haverford West in Pembrokeshire. Uh, near Tembe to do an industrial design course. Uh, so I studied industrial design for two years uh, there. wasn't I wasn't really for me. I didn't really d- didn't really enjoy it. It was very um, constrictive design wise. So when I graduated, I, I sort of just bummed around, got a job. Uh, was still drawing, but wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to go. And then found uh just sort of got some software dreamweaver i think it was which was a sort of precursor to flash um and just started doing little animations at home just sort of messing around um so i was doing that for about a year and then decided to 
go back and retrain uh, in animation. So wow. That, that was my... Wow. You came from an industrial design background initially. That was your kind of yeah. exposure to the animation world. You said you were messing around with Dreamweaver. I mean, I remember Dreamweaver back in the <laughs> sort of early noughties. Yeah. You were messing with Dreamweaver making animations. What was it that struck in you that made you think, actually, this is this is the journey for me? Um, I think it was, it's all, it was always... I mean, though Dreamweaver was in the computer, all of my time at university was done um on paper it was sort of classical animation it was always really that first line test that you do and it's to see if if your animation worked uh in that line test you sort of knew that your end product was going to work uh and it was always just that sort of immense feeling of satisfaction when you you'd spend hours or days on a sequence uh finally got some time on the rostrum camera to film it and uh, you finally got to see your work come to life. Uh, and if it, and if it worked, and if you'd managed to sort of get all of the nuances into the characters or into the effects or whatever it was that you were trying to do and trying to achieve, because um, there there was no instant playback uh, as there is now, and you can just test it. You know, you spend 15 minutes working on it, you play it back, and you can see whether it's working. But back then, it was you drew it all out you had to wait for your sort of allotted time and then you got to like really sort of see and appreciate your work um so it was yeah it's just that sort of that sort of awesome feeling of when you manage to bring something to life i think i mean i've seen a lot of your work and those of you listening if you get a chance please check out the little wild ones website because they've got some really good examples there what i really like about your work is the characters that you create have a lot of emotion in them like there's an emotive connection there which is really exciting i mean i'm not an animator but my assumption is the fun of animation is actually seeing these things come to life exactly yeah i mean i think i can't remember the uh animator's name but he was one of the disney's uh nine old men and he was he sort of said you should be able to tell the character uh in one walk cycle in one loop you shouldn't you should be able to sort of describe everything you want to about that character in one go uh, and if you can sort of achieve that or somewhere close uh then you're, you're doing a good job so you've kind of had a, a life within the agency world, I guess, and the, the broadcast world for a long time. Yeah. What was the spark that got you thinking about setting up your own company? Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I'd sort of been work- I couldn't really go any further where I was um, within the company, which was, which was fine. That, I mean, that was perfectly acceptable. Um, and then... I sort of decided to, to leave. wasn't really sure what I wanted to do or where, you know, what, what my direction was. Um, I handed in my notice and then found out a few weeks later, my wife was pregnant for the first time, um, which was a bit nerve wracking. So I, I originally planned to sort of set up on my own then five years ago, but, uh, started freelancing was really, really enjoy freelancing. Freelance is a great, great way to work for anyone who's considering it um you get to meet loads of great people work great projects great studios broad variety of industries um but then you know i've been doing that for a few years and there's there's sort of only so far you can go freelancing um and just wanted to have a little bit more control um and choice over the projects that i was working on so right. decided to sort of set up on my own um which I felt would give, hopefully give me the freedom uh, to get the types of projects that I like. Since you've started the company over the last 18 months, there's a couple of projects you've worked on, a couple that we've worked together, which we'll talk about in a sec. There's a passion project you're working on at the moment, which is this project that's focused on the plight of bees within the world. That's right, right, yeah. Talk to us about Um, that. Well, I'm... I had a family member who was very passionate um, about the bees. He was a country vet. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Um, and it was really just something that I felt that I could do um, to sort of remember him. And even back in the 90s, early early 90s, when I was living with him, he he was always passionate about the plight of the bees. And he could see the trouble they were in even then. Um, and the way that sort of industrial farming was causing pressure on their habitats um, and their well-being. So, yeah, I mean, I know I've been working on it for quite a while, but one of the positives of lockdown is I have been able to really, really crack on. So we're sort of, I'm, it's coming, it's only a short film, a few minutes long, 
um, but it's 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 coming along nicely. So um, hopefully that'll be ready to share, possibly in a few weeks' time if if uh, if all goes well. What's the name of the project? Um, well, it, it, it's still a working title. I mean, it's the trouble with bees, um, and it just it it just ex- covers our sort of cultural history with bees and um, how far back uh, we as uh, a species go with them, and our histories are interlinked. Um, the and then it covers just sort of some of the problems that they're facing again with industrial farming, uh, invasive species. Uh, pollution and what we can do uh, as individuals to help um, help support them and hope that they can continue to flourish because they're I mean they're vital for our for our ecosystem um, and yeah we really we really don't want to get into a, a state where they are gone forever. What's your aim with this film that you're making? Obviously you're looking to educate people but what's your kind of utopian vision with it? Uh Honestly, if everyone went out and started, saw it and thought, yeah, I can help and uh, went out and planted a few flowers, put them on their balconies, put them in their window boxes, uh, it all helps. It, it'll, it creates a sort of an urban um, system of way stations that can support local bee populations. Um, I mean, literally, if people went to Tesco's or any other supermarket bought a flower bought some you know some some real flowers uh, and planted those that that would be positive that would be a great a great step um in in just helping and conserving these sort of amazing creatures i mean they are you know i've sort of been doing a lot of reading and research on them and they're they're wondrous um and they're they're so vital to us it sounds like this piece of work that you're working at the moment is quite a conscious piece of film yeah, and you've done quite a bit of work within that space. I mean, you were Emmy nominated on a piece that you worked on recently. Is that right? Uh, it was a few years. It was 2016 now. Um, no, it's okay. And I I was working at Jellyfish Pictures with um, creative director Tom Brass, um, and the, the, the project changed after I worked on it. But it was a film called Spillover, Ziki, Ebola, and Beyond. Um, which is about uh, highly contagious diseases and pandemics, um, which was was nominated for a TV Emmy for art direction and design. So wow, was it nominated 2016 or 2017? I can't actually remember. With regards to the Emmy Awards, so where are the Emmy Awards held? Uh, the TV Awards were held in New York. Did you go out there? We did, yeah. We all went out as a team. There was five or six of us that were sort of worked on it and uh, were nominated. Um, and yeah, we got to go. Unfortunately, we didn't win. Um, oh no! We, I saw no. We uh, we lost to a documentary by Stephen Hawkins. So, um, which which was a great great documentary as well. So, I can't complain. They say the most important thing is just to be nominated as opposed to winning with regards to awards. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was a great. I mean, obviously, when we were working on it, you you're not expecting these things. Um, but it was it's a great it's a great documentary that's available online um and it's very sort of poignant for what's going on now i mean it was sort of you know it highlighted a lot of the issues that that we're facing right now with the current pandemic right. um so it was yeah it was good it was it was a fun fun project what was the experience of going to the emmys like yeah really good yeah it was uh uh <laughs> It, it was an, it was a sort of an all star evening. I sort of took my wife along. Um, it was great, great fun. Uh, it was nice to hang out with the rest of the team. I wasn't working there anymore. It was, I think, it was a, over a year or nearly a year after I'd worked on the project that I was uh, sort of notified that we'd been nominated. So sort of, wow. you know, you, you sort of moved on, forgot about it. Um, so it was nice to get a little bit of recognition for it. And um, yeah, it was good. What's the ceremony like? uh to be honest they're a bit it's a bit long um <laughs> and everyone's just sort of waiting for their category um and then you have to sort of sit through sit through the rest of it um yeah. and you just want to sort of get out what you know whether you sort of win or lose you want to sort of go out and then sort of chat and relax and uh have some fun afterwards um but it was really good you know first time i've been to anything like that so it was great experience yeah i bet i bet and when you say they were long how long were they oh it's about three hours yeah three, three plus hours um and i mean 
it's 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 an award ceremony so you're you know you're just you're sitting there sort of you're going through them it's not it's not edited for tv uh, so you're just you're just <laughs> sitting, sitting through it um but it was good you know it was good to see all the other winners and uh it was it was a good experience Amazing. I'm definitely going to put a link to the people listening to that film. Okay. Because, you know, just, just to be nominated for an Emmy is great. We were nominated for a project. Those of you listening, Kevin and I, well, the Little Wild Ones and Tiger Heart, worked together on a project. For Ocular Intelligence? Yes. Uh, well, the Centre for Entrepreneurs? Kevin and I worked on a project together for the Centre of Entrepreneurs. And he and I worked on a project for their first ever keynote speech, wasn't it? It was, yeah. The guy that was presenting was a guy called Eric Schmidt, who's the ex-CEO of Google. And he was like the ex-CEO of Google for about like 15, 16 years. And he was talking about the future of AI. And Kevin and I worked on that project. We basically designed, developed and produced a data visualization piece that was utilizing data from everyone in the room. And these were key people within the entrepreneurial space so you had people that run tech companies the finance space like investment space of the tech world we had a couple of curators for a couple of art galleries based all around the world we created a data visualization that utilized the data of everyone in the room specifically to where they were from in the world what part of the industry that they worked in and whether they were male and female so a really simple data set And the idea was everyone that was there, we already had their data. So we knew who they were, where they were from, et cetera. And we developed an algorithm that knew when everyone was in that room. And basically, as they arrived, they get their pass. Their pass has got an RFID chip in it. And then that RFID chip triggers this content that's visualized on the screen. But Kevin and I worked on it. And I guess this is a good time for you and I to kind of talk about that project. Because we haven't actually yeah. really had a, a post-discussion about Not it. Not really, no. I know. We just moved straight on to the next next project. What were your thoughts about that project now that it's gone live? Which was it was about two years ago. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a great project. It was good. Obviously, it was good to be working with you. Um, the for me, I mean, because it was going to be shown um, behind Eric while he was giving his speech, but on a huge scale, it had to. You know, we had to spend quite a lot of time working out because it's you know it's sort of it, we we had to find a way of representing it that was sort of nice it wasn't too imposing it was clear it looped uh seamlessly for was it a, was it 45 minutes i think he was talking for yeah um, and that was for me that was the fun part that was the challenge that was the sort of the creative challenge was how do we sort of show this in a way um that can just play nicely behind sort of without any sort of cuts or restarts or anything that was going to be too in- intrusive. Um, so I know we spent quite a lot of time coming up with various designs for that. And I know we tried out quite a few different things. Um, and without, because we weren't trying to give any sort of prominence to any particular piece of data. So it all needed to work. Uh, we, we need to go through all the categories uh, with all the people Um I know it was sort of broken down into sort of uh, male and female as well. Uh, and just trying to find a, a really nice way of, of showing that, which I think, I th- you know, it was a big sort of circular spider's web uh, that we sort of ended up going with, um, which I think worked, worked really well. I mean, we, we got great feedback on it. Um, it looked great um, and yeah, it did the job. I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, what were your thoughts? Just the same as yours in the sense that us as a business, Tiger Heart, whenever we get approached by a lot of businesses to do something that really engages with an audience at an event, the conversation usually starts off quite over the top. And the problem with data, I find from a, a visualization point of view is data is actually quite boring. Like no one really wants to look at a spreadsheet or a pie chart or something like that. And what I didn't want to do was create something, and I'm sure you got this as well, create something that would just bore the audience. It needed to kind of engage with everyone in the room so that anyone that was looking at it would be inquisitive about what it was that they were looking at. Yeah. Initially, when I spoke to the client, 
it was a really hard conversation because they were being very rational with how the visualization needed to look. And the problem with that is it just wouldn't have engaged with anyone. So we had to really kind of fight our corner with a client who, you know, a fantastic client, yeah. but you know, they had, I don't know, 150 things that they were thinking about with regards to this event. And we were like one aspect of it. And I think initially they were getting quite frustrated with our direction until they saw it. So when we had some test pieces, I'll never forget this when we she tested the initial visualization in this space. This event happened at the Royal Institute, which yeah. is just around kind of Mayfair Way. Beautiful building, quite a famous building. But um, I'll never forget, our client was late to this meeting where we were going to showcase the stuff. And it wasn't their fault, as there was like a tube strike or something in London. And then they arrived, and I'll never forget them walking into the room, quite frustrated with themselves for being late, and they were quite flustered. And then they kind of walked in, said hi to everyone, and then they turned round and looked at this visualisation. And I'll never forget just her face, our client's face, just kind of, she, she kind of stopped and was just staring at it for like... <sighs> A few seconds yeah and you know I, and that's what i wanted to instigate with everyone that turned up to that event was this moment of wow this is beautiful because technology has to be beautiful i think you know if, yeah. you're, if you're engaging if you want to inspire people it has to be beautiful so to answer your question what i thought of the project it was a tough process initially with the client yeah. because they, they I don't think they actually knew what they wanted but when they saw it and they were engaging with it it worked and and of course you know the proofs in the pudding it was nominated for a future digital thinkers award yeah, or something like so, that yeah which is brilliant yeah and just like the Emmy he didn't win it but it didn't matter you know <laughs> no no, no it's, good. it's just well it's nice to get recognition from your peers isn't it mm. um but uh I wouldn't do the work for that. I'll tell you what was really cool was also just having Eric Schmidt do his discussion about the future of artificial intelligence and, and automation and having that behind him yeah. was great because it allowed him to to kind of communicate what he wanted to communicate, but in a way that was relevant to everyone in the room because all of everyone's data was up on, on that, on that yeah. you know, that was being projected behind him. So... Yeah, was, his speech. His speech was brilliant. His uh, his talk was amazing. Uh, yeah, really inspiring. Um, it re yeah, it was good. I enjoyed enjoyed the evening. It was it was a good good night. Um, and he he made so many valid points, sort of coming from his perspective. Totally, um, and and I was I was really surprised as well because you see pictures of him, and he looks like, and I mean this with respect, he looks like a very techy person. Yeah. And he is, you know, I mean, ex CEO of Google, but he just had so much gravitas on stage. He had so much stage presence. He was engaging with everyone because he had a really, real strong personality. Yeah. And he's quite a tall lad. I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he was a tall lad. It was quite imposing. Like he had this energy, but then he was also like this, he, he kind of just felt like this, this God on stage. <laughs> it yeah. was cool. Well, I think everyone, I mean, obviously, because it was, uh an evening an event for entrepreneurs everyone um was super inspired by him uh, and super motivated so they yeah everyone got got really into it for for the whole evening and his uh question and answer session afterwards was really good and really informative about the way he sort of saw things going uh in the future with ai and also the drink up afterwards was uh, was a lot of fun as well <laughs> <laughs> yes that was a lot of fun no it was, it was a great project let's talk about the project that we just launched this year with Crisis. So those of you listening, Crisis are a, a charity that support people that are going through homelessness. And that's all levels of homelessness. So there's people that are on the street, people that are sofa surfing, and also people that are coming out of the dilemma of being homeless. Kevin and I worked on a project with them where we worked with some ex-alumni who'd gone through the process of being homeless and have had the help of crisis to help them come out of this homelessness. And we created two VR films, virtual reality films, that helped these two people communicate their story. A really important thing for us to work on because of what it was that the client was trying to communicate, but also a very emotional thing because listening to the stories of these, these two very brave people communicate what they wanted to communicate 
made me have tears in my eyes. Kevin, from your point of view, talk about the project and, and what your thoughts about the project. Um, I, I really enjoyed working on this project. Um, it's, I mean, obviously, Crisis do an amazing job and sort of anyone who's ever been touched by homelessness um, is probably well aware of them and knows the struggles and how easy it is to sort of find yourself in that situation so quickly. Um, I think sort of both of the, the participants had found themselves within a matter of weeks going from sort of working family life to sofa surfing um and struggling so i i mean the sort of the content of the the project you know i'm glad glad to have been you know a small help in that way actually working on the vr side of things um i've done a little bit of vr work before um so it was great to work on another VR project. Um, and this one, for me, really, it, it, it really sort of showed the, the real benefit. I mean, I know it wasn't sort of lots of bells and whistles, but actually putting on the headset, sitting in, in sort of one of these people's rooms um, with their whole life in them and how lonely it could feel. I think it really came across listening to their stories. Um, yeah, it was really good. Um, I think I think it worked really, really well. Um, and I'm just sort of looking forward to people being able to see it sort of the way it was intended once uh, lockdown's over and people can sort of get into um, a VR headset and um, and check it out. Absolutely. And, and just going back to what you mentioned with regards to the, the technicality level of the project, I find sometimes whenever you're trying to communicate a narrative um, with, with emerging technology, sometimes the technology takes the focus away yeah. from the story. And it was really important for us to make sure that because, you know, these stories are real stories of people that have gone through the trauma of being homeless. What we did was we recorded their accounts. We recreated a 360 scenario of something that was in line with these stories. And it would have been so easy for us to create this virtual reality world that's just a little bit too exciting. I think it would have made the story sound awful. It just would have seemed a little bit too contrived. Whilst stripping the technology back and just keeping it simple allowed for the narrative to engage with the listener or the person that's having this VR experience in a way that allowed for their imagination to take control of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's... It didn't. It really didn't need anything too technical. I think, to, as with most, you know, the creative idea it needs to be stronger um, than the sort of technical ex execution. Um, and and it just worked really nicely. It, it really made you feel in their shoes. I think. I think you know, it really put you in their shoes. Um, and you know, listening how how sort of lives unraveled and and had come back together as well which was nice it was you know crisis are there to help and they do help thousands of people um so when you're at your lowest you know reach out P people are there are, are there to help you um and it was yeah i mean it was yeah, it was just it's just a really nice project to work on it was it was good i enjoy like i say I, I really enjoy vr though i haven't done as much of it as i'd like um you know i'm looking forward hopefully to doing some more in the future um i think it's a great medium i think it's not necessarily picked up as much as as fast and as well as maybe we would have expected when uh the sort of second wave of vr sort of came out mm -hmm. um but having worked on this and sort of doing research for this project it's it's come on leaps and bounds i mean i think i think the future um is is good for vr and ar as well i think they're, they're both going to do really well and i'm sort of looking forward to doing more more projects in that in that realm in the future going back to this project though and you know you touched on the state of vr in its current yeah. format and how it hasn't kind of blossomed the way that the industry or or 
people that were trying to raise money in the industry were hoping for. Yeah. Just to give the listeners a bit of background on this project that Kevin and I have worked on together. Initially, this project we started, I think it was the beginning of 2000 and, uh, no, sorry, beginning of 2019. Yeah. And it's only during the COVID lockdown that this project has basically gone live. Yeah. And luckily, you know, I'm not trying to say that the COVID-19 scenario has been helpful for everyone, but it's just allowed for our client crisis to communicate what it wants to communicate through this medium, virtual reality, because this project for a while was being held up for various reasons. But I kind of feel that the COVID-19 lockdown has just enabled this project to move forward quicker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's... um... I think it, I mean, I think it was probably for crisis. I mean, it was, it was a risk doing it this way. Um, it was obviously new, new technology for them, uh, how it was going to be used, how people are going to interact with it. Um, but I think with, with lockdown, it's made it more, more accessible in, in, in a sort of strange way to people. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously, the, the initial launch has been delayed because of COVID. Um, but I'm hoping people are going to get to see it, it in the format that it's intended because um, it will it will provoke an emotion in people. I, I definitely think so. They were both, you know, both the people really sort of put their, their heart on their sleeves for it. Um, and, you know, it must have been very trying, challenging for them uh, to sort of speak so openly about the problems that they faced. Um, mm. It was also quite a challenge from Crisis's point of view to create this project as well. Their digital strategy is still in its infancy. And when I say digital, yep. I mean from a technology point of view. And one of the reasons why they approached us was because they knew that we specialise in emerging technology and they, it's something they wanted to explore. Yep. And from a production process this was a real challenge for them because they've never really had to create virtual reality content that's specific to the alumni that have gone through the crisis yeah. machine. Yep. That was really interesting from my point of view to kind of work with the team at crisis in making this vision a reality. You've worked, uh, you've worked with crisis before though, haven't you? Yeah. So yeah. they, so just to give a bit of background, Tiger Heart were approached by crisis a while ago. We run a, a technology conference called creative futures and they wanted to engage with the technology industry because they felt there was an opportunity for tech companies to innovate within the the charity space. And so they, they approached us and there's a, a fantastic guy called Richard Lee who basically talks about crisis and talks about homelessness at the events. And so, yeah, that's kind of where our conversation started. He approached us about creating a VR film. Yeah. And his problem with the the conversations he was having with the tech sector initially was that to create a VR film was just too expensive. And the ideas the tech companies were bringing to them were too convoluted. And so, yeah, he came to Tiger Heart and said, look, we want to do a VR film. We don't have a lot of budget, but we don't want to do something too crazy, you know, because when you're exploring technology, it needs to be a step by step process as opposed to a all in or nothing yeah yeah uh, i mean just the whole concept of sort of putting on a headset a lot of people still haven't even tried it um it's it's it, it's a very different experience to the way we normally um consume media yeah. um and if if you if you went all bells and whistles you would definitely be detracting from the me- from the message um of these films which you know i think you know you and, me, you and i spoke about it and it was like the key thing here is is the people involved above anything else you know getting that story across in a sort of a respectful way is key um because we could have done you know we i know we t- we had conversations about oh, what about this and what about that um which we, we which we could have done and, and, and it would look great and still would have would have delivered the brief but it it would have been for show it would you know it didn't it wouldn't have helped um the story at all um or get that emotional sort of message across that we that we spoke we felt that was important and sort of aligned with what crisis wanted to do 
Absolutely. And what, what I'm really happy about uh, following on from the delivery of this project is that the client's super happy with what's been created yeah. and they want to make more VR films, you yeah. know, so that's the beauty of yeah. and the wonderfulness of what we've done. So Kev, we've yep. spoken about some of the stuff that you've done, we've spoken about some of the projects that we've worked on. Yeah. From an animation point of view, I guess I, I just wanted to pick your brain here. Who are your influences from, you know, an animator? <laughs> um, oh, who are my influences? I mean, my, I mean, I think my sort of love of animation and really, I mean, I know I sort of spoke about uh, sort of doing my industrial design course, but I think the thing that really sort of piqued my interest before be, before studying um, was uh, Beauty and the Beast by Disney. Oh, right. Uh, with, um, there's lots of other influences, but I can remember seeing that and seeing the uh, the ballroom scene. Um, with the sort of 360, with, where they'd created the room in 3D, and it was one of the early sort of 3D renderings in a Disney movie. And then the dance uh, between the Beast and Belle was all hand drawn um, by James Baxter, if I remember correctly, uh, who was is an amazing, to, amazing animator, um, and he'd he'd done the whole sequence on his own. Um, really and it blew it blew my mind uh do, do you know what do you know what it's, it's, so yeah. this is really interesting and you're probably going to shoot me um I'm a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big disney fan yeah but do you know i've never seen beauty and the beast <laughs> oh dear um well i know what you're doing this evening then <laughs> uh, well, well the funny thing is the live action film came out yeah. 2017 i think beginning yeah. of 2017 my wife got us uh, tickets to the premiere right and we went to that and you know, we met some really interesting people like Emma Watson and Dan Stevens, the guy who plays the Beast. Yeah, it was incredible, and the film was incredible. But I remember saying to someone that I, when I was I was working somewhere, and I said, oh, "I'm going to the the premiere of Beauty and the Beast," and she's like, "Oh, I love that Disney," and I said, "Oh, I haven't seen it," and she literally. <laughs> Honestly, it, lo it looked like her eyes were going to like shoot lasers <laughs> into my skull because I've heard it's like one of the best Disney animations ever made. It's it's just a great all round film. I mean, I know it's a bit soppy, but it's just a great film. Um, I've I mean, I've got a five year old now, and I, I sort of made him watch it, but he really enjoys it. <laughs> um, the story's great, the characters are great, the animations. Beautiful. Was it ninety? I'm going to say ninety three, but I could be really wrong there. Um, but it's just a, a great all round film. But I mean, it's. I mean, it's. A, I've, I mean, I watch. You know, I mean, there's all the classics like Akira, Ghost in the Shell, um, which are all great. I mean, I've. I just like how I just like the medium. Um, I love stop motion. I love three D, two D, Lego animations. You know, I just I like. I like the way people create characters and sort of can breathe life into their animations. Um, and whenever people do that, I, I find that really inspiring. You know, even if it's little stick, I know there's some great sort of stick man animations online that are, that are brilliant. Um, I, you know, I mean, Annecy's on at the moment. I don't know if you know Annecy. It's a, it's one of the biggest animation festivals based. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe you, yeah, it's usually in Annecy in south of France, uh, which obviously with COVID has been, uh, but, well, it's been postponed. It's online now. So this week is actually Annecy Festival. So you can um, get tickets, like a, a cheap online ticket to watch all of the programs. Um, so I've been watching some of that today um, and we'll hopefully try and find some more time during the week to uh, watch some more. Um, I think, yeah, I just, I just really like, I like the fact that it's so accessible to anyone yeah um any anyone can start doing it especially now as well i mean the course i was on i think they used to only take i mean not when i did but they used to only take like sort of 12 people a year um so that was the sort of the funnel and the restriction of getting into the animation industry yeah but now anyone with a with an ipad and procreate can get started get making films um tell their story um it, it, it's a lot cheaper it's a lot easier than sort of live action even even more so now with what's going on in the world yeah um it's just a you know 
there's there's so many beautiful aspects of it the the artistry the storytelling um it's yeah i just yeah i i mean every, you know every week I, I see something that's just like oh i wish i'd done something as good as that <laughs> I, I wish you know stuff that inspires me and it's like oh, i add another idea to my sort of you know my notepad of ideas and it's like oh i remember that one because that was brilliant that was beautiful um yeah i think it's just it's just one of those mediums that i think is accessible to everyone and anyone um yep. either sort of making it or receiving it um it must i think it'd be hard pressed to find people who really have a dislike for animation i mean obviously there are films and content that you, you may not enjoy but i mean everyone everyone enjoyed enjoyed cartoons at some point in their life haven't they yeah pretty much and if um, you meet someone that doesn't they're probably crazy um, <laughs> yeah. if you are listening to this and you are crazy please don't contact us no i'm joking um <laughs> we're, we're all crazy it's it's well, totally fine if anyone does want to contact who is crazy we can uh, easily send them out some uh, some films for them to watch to see <laughs> whether we can convert them <laughs> you touched on your influences as an animator what is your advice to anyone that's interested in getting into the animation space advice i mean i think really what i just said i mean if you want to make something just just get on and make it um really don't worry too much about i mean one have fun but don't worry too much about pr producing a, a beautiful finished film uh, i know a lot of people get hung up and i have done and, and do on making something that's perfect um but if you're if you're waiting to make a perfect film, you'll you'll never finish it. Um, make it, finish it, show it, move on. Um, I I'd say probably. I mean, I I could be wrong now, but I you I know mean, I see a lot of people commenting about whether to get form, formal training. Um, mm. I don't think I've got to say I don't think that's too important anymore there are there are obviously benefits from getting a formal education but there's so much uh training accessible online now that you 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 know any problem that you've got you can you can find the answer online so you can just get on and make your film or your animation or your gifts or whatever it is that you're that you want to do you can just get on and do it um and just get it out there um if you're if you or if you're already working definitely make time for your personal projects um i've always found that when i've done personal projects they've led me to more work of the type of work that i like um just because people have engaged with those those projects or films or little animations and they want you to do something similar for them um and it's and it's really important to have, you know, a little bit of commercial work's great, um, but quite often it can be for subject matter or content or in a style that you you know you're not really that that engaged not engaged I think it's, it's the wrong word but there there are other things you'd rather be doing, um, and it's and you'll get that release in your in your personal projects i also believe through the kind of nurturing of your creative flair you'll get more commercial work um, yes. some of the biggest clients i've ever worked for have approached me because of the the strange projects that i've worked on yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you'll be surprised because you think especially in the tech world you know a lot of tech companies they'll build a product and then they'll approach brands going right this is right for you this is right for you and a lot of brands don't buy into it because they have the power and they don't see outside of their current perspective of where that yeah. vision can take them. And it's only when you start to kind of explore the technology or the whatever the creative outlet is that you start to define things that haven't been seen before and you start to define your own language, you know, um, yeah. or I'm oh, sorry, identity. Yeah. Your own uh, visual style. I mean, a lot of the bigger brands, they, they want something that's unique. Um, and the problem with working on lots of commercial projects is you're, you know, you're following a brand guidelines, you're following a certain style for that particular brand. Whereas your, your personal stuff is where you can just have some fun and enjoy and, you know, do some R and D and learning and training. And, uh, those unique elements, um, are the things that people are going to look out for. 
um, when they when they contact you. You know, pe- people will ask you, uh, they'll refer back to those projects, mm. um, which is really important. Totally. So, yeah, those of you listening, just get your hands dirty. Um, yeah, and, exactly, and, you know, yeah. Make some mistakes. We've touched on your influences. You've given some advice. Um, this is quite a personal question. Um, and I'm only going to ask you this because obviously I know you, I've known you for a long time. Yeah. Your wife, Samantha, she trained as a, as an animation artist as well. She did, yeah. How did you guys meet? Uh, on our animation course. At ah, okay. Uh, Cause I, I met you through her. You did. Yeah. Cause you two used to work at tower records, if I remember correctly. Virgin. Virgin. Virgin sorry. <laughs> <In Canada. laughs> Have I aged you? Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. Well, Sam, uh, went, she, she was in the same, same, same group as me, same course. Um, ours okay. was, uh, I think back in the eighties and sort of seventies, um, the, it was, it was very, because they were state funded, um, they only accepted 10 or 12 people. When we did it, I think there was probably about a hundred and 150 who started, wow. uh, but only, I'm going to say about 60 or 70 who finished. Right. Um, and at, of them, a lot of people just said, I animation's not for me. I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think from our course, probably only that I'm aware of, probably only about sort of a dozen still maybe work in, in the industry in some form or other. Right. Uh, and a lot of other people just went off to do other things. I think part of the problem is animation sounds like it'll be a really sort of fun, cool thing to do, which it is. But when you're doing sort of hand-drawn animation on paper, it's, you know, 16, 17 hours a day just sitting in front of a light box drawing pretty much the same thing again and again and again. Right. Uh, um, so you've got to be quite committed. Um, and when things, it's, you know, it's not for everyone. Um, but there's a lot less. I mean, well... I was, Obviously, the, the hand-drawn style, which is great, has come back in now with the likes of sort of Flash and Adobe Animate and Toon Boom and stuff like that, which is amazing because it's sort of it's made the whole process a lot quicker and easier, and the amends are a lot quicker and easier. Right. Uh, um, but it's not. It, it's still not quick, um, and it is just a lot of sitting, sitting on your own, uh, just just working. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Uh, you know, a, a lot of animators I've, I've, I know sort of said, yeah, COVID hasn't really made much of an impact on them. Uh, <laughs> just, still just sitting at home on their own in their offices, uh, drawing stuff. Um, but yeah, so no, me and Sam, yeah, we met, we met at Farn and we didn't actually get together till after uh, graduation. Um, and we so been- I don't- I know this is going to sound a bit weird, but yeah. I remember what I think the first time I met you was at Sam's birthday in near Baker street. Yeah. Um, we, we were, I, we were at, um, I think it was like her, her mum's flat, I think it was. So, yeah. And it was the first time I met you and you guys weren't together, but I could That's tell, right. <laughs> I could tell there was a, a little spark there. This, yeah, that seems to be a running theme. Everyone else seemed to know before we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've been married nearly 12 years now amazing uh, 12 years this year um one one son seb five-year-old uh <laughs> which is yeah all good yeah it's all good uh she doesn't she's still very creative uh, she does like i say she uh, works with me but sort of more on the um producer production side um but she also works in uh fashion retail as well yeah a, a fantastic company called matches it is which, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah who have uh, yeah. gone from strength to strength and that's another podcast which we'll save for another time <laughs> um, <laughs> kev it's been wonderful having you on the show okay. if anyone listening for them how can they get in contact with you um i mean best best place is going to be well i'm on instagram as the little wild ones um or via the website the little wild ones dot um, com. Dot com sorry yeah www dot um yeah if anyone you know wants to chat about anything please get in touch brilliant thanks so much buddy i really appreciate you being on the show i'm sure a lot of people listening to this would have got a lot of 
value from it. Those of you listening, thanks so much for just sticking with this. You know, we're really proud to have such a great audience listening to these conversations that we're having within the world that we work in. If you like what you're listening to, please do share. The hashtag is Tiger Heart Chats, all one word. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, be good.